Hello, everybody. So today, um, the main focus, I suppose, of this lecture is going to be on Christian science and the stuff that kind of comes after it. The story of Christian science is a little bit different from the story of the Latter-day Saints. I talked about how over time the Latter-day Saints became less radical and um, sought to assimilate more with mainstream American culture, especially around the time that Utah was seeking to become a state. So Christian science is a little bit different in that it remains a distinct religious movement, but with a very small number of adherents. So Mormons are like 15 million. We can number actual Christian scientists in the tens of thousands. Okay, so it's a pretty small movement today. However, um, Christian science kind of spun off a whole bunch of different religious movements that were kind of closely related to it. Um, the most important one was something called New Thought, and New Thought has gradually kind of morphed into what we now know as the New Age movement, or what some people might call positive thinking. Um, you know, it, it, we, it's, it became something that we kind of see all over um, modern culture, modern religious culture, modern popular culture, etc. So it's a different story. It's a story of how um, a religious movement became less of a distinct thing, even though there is such a thing as the Church of Christian Science, um, or the Church of Christ Scientist, as they call it, but also how kind of the main ideas of this religion have basically kind of penetrated every aspect of modern life in a lot of ways. Um, the other focus of this lecture today is going to be on William James himself, who wrote the uh, lecture on healthy-minded religion, which comes from his Varieties of Religious Experience, um, because he's another important perspective on how we think about religion. He's an important scholar of religion himself. Um, if you recall, back um, when we talked about Ralph Waldo Emerson, I tried to kind of put the development of American Protestantism in the context of intellectual history. And I'm going to try to do a little bit of that here as well by talking not about how we got from um, Jonathan Edwards, who bases all of his claims on the Bible, to Ralph Waldo Emerson, who bases most of his claims on his observations of nature and his own kind of idiosyncratic reading of the Bible. Um, but how we got from transcendentalism to pragmatism. So, like, transcendentalism was this movement that kind of um, had its high point in the middle of the 19th century, and pragmatism is kind of the thing that came after it, okay? So after the Civil War, um, as a result of kind of the acceleration of scientific discovery at the end of the um, 19th century, as well as changes in Western culture, um, you get this new philosophical movement called pragmatism. And one of the leaders of this um, was William James, who was first and foremost a neuroscientist and a psychologist, so one of the first scientists to bring the study of psychology to the United States. Um, but he was also a philosopher, and he was very, very interested in religion. Um, so, uh, what do we need to know about William James and how he thinks? Um, well, first of all, like Ralph Waldo Emerson, William James is very interested in the question of epistemology. And epistemology comes from the Greek word for knowledge. And epistemology is essentially the study of knowledge. How do we know stuff? Um, and we talked about, when we talked about Edwards and Emerson, we talked a little bit, of, again, about how Edwards bases his truth claims on the scripture and how um, Emerson bases his truth claims on something else. Now, what Edwards and Emerson share is um, something called foundationalism. When Edwards and Emerson make claims about who God is, about who Jesus is, about human nature, etc., they are basing their claims on some kind of ground, some kind of indisputable foundation that can't be questioned, okay? So um, foundationalism is basically the belief that knowledge claims must be rooted in indisputable foundations. So in order to get to the truth, we have to base all of our claims on something that cannot be disputed. And the reason for naming foundationalism is because we're later going to get to anti-foundationalism. Okay, so um, an example of this would be come directly from Emerson's Divinity School Address. You know, for Emerson again, or excuse me, for Edwards again, um, the indisputable foundation would of course be the Bible, the Word of God. 
Um, but we can see that even though Emerson is a very radical thinker for the middle of the 19th century, um, he is still basing his claims on this idea of indisputable foundations. So he says, the intuition of the moral sentiment is an insight of the perfection of the laws of the soul. These laws execute themselves. They are out of time, out of space, and not subject to circumstance. Okay, so like th this idea that there are laws out there in the universe that dictate who we are, um, why we exist, how we ought to relate to each other, how we ought to act. These are based on self-executing laws that are completely outside of our ability to perceive them. Okay, um, so again, he's appealing to this idea of a foundation. Um, likewise, um, the thinkers, the Enlightenment thinkers who came up with the Declaration of Independence kind of have something similar going on. They say, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal and they are endowed by the Creator with certain inalienable rights. Okay, so again, the idea that the rights of men are rooted in these truths that are self-evident and that exist outside of us and our ability to understand them. Okay, so um, again, foundationalism is this, this idea that knowledge claims must be rooted in indisputable foundations, but the foundations can come from different places. So um, if you are a conservative theologian like Edwards, it comes from scripture. If you are a realist, like an, uh, an enlightenment lib classical liberal, then the foundations come from experience, so your observations of the world around you. Um, if you are an idealist, which is a, is, an, is a philosophy that Emerson kind of played with at times, then you believe that, um, your, uh, th that uh, indisputable foundations come from insight, come from looking within yourself. Okay, and um, sometimes Emerson is more of a realist and sometimes Emerson is more of an idealist. Like he, he thought idealists had um, a lot of good things to say, but he didn't go completely all in. Um, with Mary Baker Eddy, we are going to have a person who goes pretty much all in. Okay, so you can kind of see how this continuum sets up a little bit of a problem, similar to the problem that is set up by the Protestant Reformation itself. So remember that one of the big innovations of the Protestant Reformation was, again, this idea of the priesthood of all believers. And as we talked about with Joseph Smith, one of the problems with authorizing everybody to be interpreters of the scriptures for themselves to be their own priests is that you can wind up with a variety of different interpretations of what the scripture means and a variety of different interpretations of what God wants, etc. Um, likewise, when you authorize people to use their own insight, their explorations of themselves, in order to understand truths about the world, um, you uh, wind up running the risk of creating like a whole bunch of different insights, a whole bunch of different bases for truth, okay? And this is part of what Emerson had a problem with. Um, you know, but we do get statements like this, the intuition of the moral sentiment is an insight of the perfection of the laws of the soul. Again, you know, the, from the same quote. So Emerson is kind of coming right up against this idea, but he, he won't go kind of all in um, in the rest of his work. Um, he says later in this, um, in the Divinity School Address that you read several weeks ago, um, Meantime, whilst the doors of the temple stand open night and day before every man, and the oracles of truth cease never, it is guarded by one stern condition, this namely, it is an intuition, it cannot be received at second hand. Uh, meaning that in order to know the truth, you have to know the truth yourself, he says. What he announces, I must find true in me, or wholly reject and on his word or as his second, be he who he may, I can accept nothing. So basically, in order to know the truth, you absolutely have to know it for yourself. You have to feel inside of you that it is true, okay? Um, so again, foundationalism is this idea that knowledge claims must be rooted in indisputable foundations. But once you get this kind of transcendentalist or idealist innovation, this idea that you have to know the truth for yourself and you look within yourself in order to find the truth, um, well then, you know, maybe uh, we get to a place in which our insight is really all we have, that all we really know is ourselves. And so it becomes impossible for our, us actually to know 
um, truths about the external world. Rather, we're just kind of relying on our own sense processes and on our own mental process in order to understand what the truth is. Um, so maybe if we're relying a lot on insight, and even if we're relying on like sense experience, we don't really have contact with the truth. We don't really have any foundations upon which we can base claims to know the truth. Um, and so then you get kind of the idea of anti-foundationalism, okay? So, um, and this is the innovation that kind of comes about, um, becomes more mainstream, shall we say, at the end of the 19th century. So, um, just to review, foundationalism says knowledge claims must be rooted in indisputable foundations. Emerson says we know about the world through our insight. The anti-foundationalist would say, uh, William James would say, that our insight is all we really know. Okay? Emerson would say that we judge a proposition against higher truths. So, in order to determine whether we are having an insight about the truth, we have to judge it against something that exists out there in the universe. And James says, basically, we can't really know anything about those higher truths, so we need different ways to judge things. Okay, so this is where we come to this chapter from um, varieties of religious experience. I am going to summarize just a little bit some of what he says in the introduction, because I didn't actually have you read it. Um, but basically what um, James says is that there's two ways to basically judge an idea. Um, we can judge the idea existentially. So talk about what is the origin or the nature of the thing? Where, where did it come from? Or we can use a spiritual form of its judgment, of judgment, where in which we say basically what is its value. And um, in order to help you understand this, we'll talk about how this applies to the concept of religion. Okay, um, basically what James says is that if we were to take something like the Bible, like the foundation of an entire religion, and try to make some kind of judgment about whether it contains truth, well then we might try to judge the Bible on the claims it makes about itself or on the, uh, the claims that other people make about it. So plenty of people claim that the Bible is the word of God. And so, therefore, that it can't contain any lies in it, and it can't contain, I guess, any any um, untruths in it, any any inconsistencies, any falsehoods, etc. Um, so then, if you go looking around um, at kind of the history of the Bible and how it was put together, um, as was happening in the middle of the 19th century, um, you kind of inevitably discover that the Bible really kind of has some human origins that many of the biblical writers were writing, you know, about events as they understood them at the time, or even that our accounts of things like the life of Jesus may be coming to us like second or third or even fourth hand, that we don't necessarily have eyewitness accounts of um, certain events in the life of Jesus. Okay, and so um, once you kind of take all of that information in, then you might very well say, well, the Bible is not the word of God. It is the work of men. Um, and so therefore, we can't believe anything that the Bible says. Therefore, it's basically worthless. And, you know, this is kind of what was going on around William James in the late 19th century. You had the emergence of this movement called positivism. You know, so basically, if, you know, if the Bible is not the word of God, then we, we just kind of have to reject it wholesale and we have to rely on something else. But William James kind of tries to create a space in which religion still has something to tell us about who we are and about how we should act in the world. Um, and in which we can still say that religion is valuable, even if we can't like judge its truth claims um, against some kind of indisputable foundation. So he says, um, if our theory of revelation value were to affirm that any book to possess it must have been composed automatically or not by the free caprice of the writer, or that it must exhibit no scientific and historic errors and express no local or personal passions, the Bible would probably fare ill at our hands. But if, on the other hand, our theory should allow that a book may well be a revelation in spite of errors and passions and deliberate human composition, if only it be a true record of the inner experiences of great-souled persons wrestling with the crises of their fate, then the verdict would be much more favorable. So basically he's saying, 
that if we try to judge the Bible based on whether we or not we think it is the actual literal word of God and contains absolutely no truths and no like um, things that were deliberately in, um, in introduced through the human writers, um, then I guess the Bible would kind of fail. It says it would probably fare ill at our hands. But if we look to the Bible as the record of the inner experiences of people wrestling with the crises of their fate, so if we're looking to it as like a, a, a kind of document of how people have wrestled with the big questions of life, um, then we might say that the Bible actually has tremendous value because it explores all of the all of the big topics that we all want to know about. Where do we come from? What does it mean to live as a human being? How do we treat one another, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? What happens after we die? You know, what is the point of our existence, et cetera? Like this is this is the record of people dealing with these problems. And so James says, therefore, you know, it must have some kind of value. Um, likewise, he um, he kind of moves on from that to create almost a kind of more consequentialist understanding of the value of religion. So when talking about religious experience, so like when people claim to have had visions or because they claim to have spoken to God like Joseph Smith or spoken to an angel like Joseph Smith, James thinks about, again, two ways to judge that kind of claim. You know, we could say that a guy like Joseph Smith, assuming that he's not a charlatan, assuming that he wasn't trying to just fool all of his followers, um, we could say that maybe Joseph Smith was having some kind of delusion. You know, that maybe he had a mental illness, or maybe he had some kind of traumatic experience that caused him to kind of dissociate from reality or to... Um, uh, have a very vivid dream in which he thought, you know, so we could point to all kinds of organic or biological or even medical um, reasons for why Joseph Smith thought he saw what he saw. Okay, so, um, you know, on that basis, then we would have to say that, well, Joseph Smith may have really believed what he said, but I mean, what he said was basically false because, you know, it was the result of delusion. It was the result of mental illness, etc. So, but James says is there's another way to think about it. He says, when we think of certain states of mind superior to others, it is ever because, is it ever because of what we know concerning their organic antecedents? He says, no, it is always for two entirely different reasons. It is either because we take immediate delight in them or else it is because we believe them to bring us good consequential fruits for life. Okay, so it's, this is suggesting that the way we ought to judge something like the visions of Joseph Smith is not based on the idea, you know, of whether they were like an actual literal revelation from God versus like the product of some problem in Joseph Smith's mind, but on whether those revelations helped Joseph Smith live a better life or helped his followers live a better life. And there are many different ways that we could actually judge that. And we could even consider it to be a beautiful thing. Okay, so just to kind of go back again, um, foundationalism, you know, the idea that truth claims need to be rooted in, um, in indisputable foundations. A realist says it's rooted in experience, so like direct observation of the world. Empiricism, sense experience, etc. Idealism says we know about the world through our insight and through our intuition, through looking within ourselves. Um, the anti-foundationalist says basically we can never know the indisputable foundations um, for truth claims, whether we look to experience or to insight, um, we can only ever really judge an idea based on its consequences. So this is where the term pragmatism comes from, is this idea that we judge whether an idea is a good one based on the results it produces in people's lives, and not necessarily whether it um, conforms to some external idea of reality. Okay, so that's, this is where James kind of winds up, and I am going to kind of place Mary Baker Eddy a little bit in between these two, actually. Um, one of the arguments of my book, essentially, is that Mary Baker Eddy is an important figure who helps kind of bridge this gap between idealism, which is something that Emerson is coming right up against, but again, he stays with those indisputable foundations, and pragmatism. So the idea that, our ide that we should see the consequences of these ideas working in the world. Okay, so that's where we will kind of go next. All right, is the context for Christian science. Okay, so um, I promise we're going to kind of bring it back to how this is all relevant to William James um, in a few minutes. But first, I need to kind of lay some more groundwork um, and talk about how Christian science kind of takes off as a religious and a healing movement in the 19th century. So 
um, during the Enlightenment, particularly actually during the French Enlightenment, um, there were uh, kind of there there was this guy named Franz Mesmer. All right, and Franz Mesmer, um, we might today kind of think of him as a little kooky, a little strange, like he had some really weird ideas. This is the guy for whom the word mesmerism, which is usually kind of used as synonymous with um, hypnotism, um, came from. Franz Mesmer had this idea that every, that human bodies reacted in this very um, important way to magnetism. And like this was based a little bit on some ideas that were happening like in 18th century science at the time, um, but it was also based on Mesmer's own observations that um, you could basically get people to do things or experience certain states or exhibit certain signs of symptoms um, basically by just kind of suggesting it to them. He started to notice that um, that the mind basically had a very powerful effect on the body. And actually, where this came from originally is, um, uh, you know, we haven't really talked about this, but there is a ritual in Catholicism called exorcism. And if you've seen horror movies, you probably know uh, a little bit about this. So there was that famous film, The Exorcist, of course, that was made back in the 1970s um, that, that kind of explores this in detail. Um, so exorcism is basically this ritual that allows the priest to cast demons out of a person that is supposedly demon-possessed. And like one of the hallmarks of an exorcism was the fact that when the priest like held up the cross or used the holy water, um, the person who was supposedly possessed would exhibit all kinds of crazy symptoms. Like they would begin um, speaking different languages supposedly, or they would um, begin having convulsions, having seizures, vomiting, um, crying out in pain, etc., etc. They would exhibit all kinds of symptoms that appeared to be real. Well, Mesmer realized that he could actually cause people to have symptoms just by kind of rubbing magnets over their body. Um, and uh, that, that he could actually kind of, he could make people feel better or even feel worse um, by rubbing magnets over their body. Um, of course, the magnets were completely incidental. Like, uh, people at the time were kind of interested in magnets. They seemed a little bit magic. It seemed like they ought to have something, you know, some, some kind of useful health application. And so um, Mesmer would rub magnets over people and he would like set up these big tubs that were full of water and had these magnetic rods inside of them. And like very rich people in Paris would um, stand around the tub and hold onto these metal rods and supposedly get some kind of healing benefit from it. And uh, Mesmer would actually kind of walk around the room in this cape like um, like a magician or something. But this is supposedly like a form of healing. This is something people did for their health. So Mesmer later decided that the magnets were unnecessary and that rather um, just the interaction between um, human bodies itself was enough to elicit the same symptoms. So he um, invented this theory of something called animal magnetism which was the idea that like just by kind of running your hands over a person, you could produce very um, similar symptoms. So you could make somebody feel better or you could make them feel worse just by kind of <coughs> um, interacting with them in this particular way. So mesmerism and hypnotism, which was related to it, becomes really popular in Europe. And it also becomes popular in North America. This, by the way, is a picture of rich Parisians standing around one of Mesmer's uh, magnetic tubs. Um, and uh, it begins to, it gets adapted in a lot of different ways. Okay, there was an early psychologist named Jean Charcot, so another Frenchman, <clears throat> who realized that, again, he could um, produce um, symptoms in hysteria patients um, just by merely suggesting it to them. So, you know, if he told somebody that they had a symptom, um, they would uh, kind of produce it, basically. And he did all these kind of creepy demonstrations with female patients because hysteria was thought to be a problem that afflicted only women. And it was basically the idea that your uterus um, caused you to have mental illness of some kind. And men could be diagnosed with um, hysteria, but it was usually called something a little bit different. Okay, so Charcot was one who kind of realized that he could produce these symptoms without the magnets, without touching people. You know, just by merely suggesting the idea to somebody, um, he could cause a patient to have symptoms. Um, so there was a guy named Charles Poyen who actually brought mesmerism into the United States. 
And Poyen had a student who was named Phineas Parkhurst Quimby, which is just a wonderful name. Um, so Quimby was trained as a mesmerist by Charles Poyen, um, kind of followed him around the United States um, <clears throat> as he was preferring, performing these kinds of mesmeric healings. And Quimby thought it all looked kind of creepy. Um, it all smacked a little bit of magic. Um, and he, he had the kind of the insight that basically, um, a little bit like Charcot, that you didn't need all of the drama. You didn't need the big tub. You didn't need the magnets. You also didn't need Mesmer running around in the cape. Um, you didn't need to even touch a person. Again, merely by talking to somebody, <clears throat> you could cause them to feel better or even to feel worse. So Quimby gradually came to um, the belief that when people have physical complaints, so when they feel sick, um, when they're depressed, when they have addiction problems, etc., that this is all simply a problem with the mind. Now, of course, you can say that that is to a certain extent true. Um, we often refer to addiction problems as mental illnesses. We know that mental illnesses exist. We have a whole classification of illnesses that have kind of a psychogenic um, explanation. And we also know that um, mental illness can actually show up in your body. You know, when you feel depressed, you have a hard time sleeping, perhaps, or you get more headaches, or you have a lot of fatigue, you feel kind of listless, you have a hard time getting out of bed in the morning, you may even have nausea. You know, so purely like something that is, is rooted in your mind, a, a, um, a mental illness can actually manifest symptoms of physical illness. So we know that this is true. But Quimby came to apply this idea to basically everything and basically believed that there was no reality in disease whatsoever. Okay? And that in order to get better, no matter what your complaint, all you needed to do is realize that you weren't really sick and then you would feel better. So he believed that the mind was basically the root of all disease and all suffering. Okay, so one of Quimby's students was a woman named Mary Baker Eddy. Um, she became his student um, from 1862 to 1866. 1866 is when Phineas Quimby died quite suddenly. Um, and Mary Baker Eddy went on to found Christian science um, very shortly after his death. Okay, so um, <clears throat> before we move on, let me also kind of explain um, what the context is here for medicine. Um, because it might seem a little ridiculous, this idea that basically all illness has some root in the mind. Um, but uh, there are reasons why this might actually be sort of a very appealing idea, um, even a very popular idea. And one of the reasons was that 19th century medicine really was not very good. Okay, so doctors in the middle of the 19th century were not very well professionalized. Very few barriers to practicing medicine actually existed. So in the United States, at least, you could practice medicine without any kind of license. You could claim to be a doctor if you attended medical school. Um, uh, anybody who had a barn could set up a medical school. Um, medical school maybe lasted one year, and you could do it all by correspondence. Um, so you could graduate with a medical degree without ever, like, examining a patient um, you might have gotten some practice on, you know, some, some like anatomy experience by uh, looking, dissecting cadavers and that kind of thing. So um, medicine was not very well professionalized. There were a lot of people running around claiming to be doctors who like had only like a marginal acquaintance with human anatomy and, um, and all of that stuff. And um, even very educated doctors still relied on treatments that we now know to be completely ineffective um, and, uh, I, and, and also like perhaps even dangerous. So at the time, in the middle of the 19th century, doctors were still using what was called heroic treatments. And the idea of heroic treatments is basically that um, you need to produce some, some kind of big effect in the patient in order to purge the disease from them. So like the, the whole thing with bloodletting was the idea that there's too much blood in the body and that's what's making you sick. And so you need to open up a vein and let the blood drain out. Um, there was something called calomel dosing, which was basically mercury poisoning. 
um, you know, until patients' gums bled or until they started vomiting. So the use of purgatives, things that make you vomit, um, things that give you ulcers, like all, all kinds of kind of nasty stuff. Like this is what even very well-educated doctors were doing for all different kinds of illnesses. And we now know it to be completely ineffective. And it was also really unpleasant to undergo one of these treatments. You did not want to be like prescribed bloodletting, um, you know, for your case of the flu or something like that. You know, so Louis Pasteur's germ theory of disease only appeared in, a, in the early 1860s, and it took decades for it to become more widely accepted. And likewise, Joseph Lister, Lister's theories of sanitation were resisted well into the early 20th century. Okay, so it wouldn't be until like the 1910s when doctors in the United States even had to have a university degree. Um, and like the germ theory of disease and the, um, the idea of sanitation that, you know, you needed to say, wash your hands in between patients. Um, the story of how they, Joseph Lister discovered this is pretty gruesome. You can go take that Wikipedia trip if you would like to. Um, but these, these ideas did not become really mainstream in medicine until well, until, um, well into the early 20th century. So basically 19th century medicine is really, uh, uh problematic, really kind of unpleasant, um, not terribly scientific, etc. And for that reason, there were lots and lots and lots of what we call medical sects. So just like you can have a religious sect, we in medical history often talk about medical sects. So people like people who had some alternative theory of disease that was opposed to mainstream medicine. So homeopathy, which is this idea that you can kind of cure anything by um, using a chemical that produces the same symptoms as the disease except you use that chemical in like a microdose, like a very, very, very teeny, 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 teeny amount of the medicine dissolved into a whole bunch of water to the point where there may only be like one atom of the medicine left in the water. There was osteopathy, which is the idea that your bones are the root of all disease. There was phrenology, which is the idea that the lumps on your head say something about you and your personality and your health. Um, there were patent medicines, which is basically when, this is a patent medicine ad, by the way, um, over here on the left, um, is basically when, you know, total con artists, charlatans would like mix together um, a concoction that they claimed would make you better. Um, usually they did because very often they contained alcohol and um, sometimes they contained heroin and or cocaine. Um, so they made you feel better, <laughs> but um, they weren't actually killing your call or they weren't actually curing your cholera or your cancer or anything like that. There was water cure, which is the idea that um, taking baths could help you. There was um, electroshock, which is the idea that running electrical currents through your body could um, could cure you. And there was eclecticism, which was just basically a mix of all different kinds of theories of disease. So you had a lot of these, and they all kind of had their partisans. And in fact, many of them had their own schools. So there were homeopath there were homeopathic medical schools and osteopathic medical schools. And in fact, there are still osteopathic medical schools um, in the United States, and there are osteopathic hospitals. Um, some of these got kind of absorbed into mainstream medicine, and some of them um, basically just kind of disappeared in the 20th century. So um, this is where we come back to Mary Baker Eddy, because Mary Baker Eddy um, develops a religious group that is both a religion and a kind of medical sect. All right, so a little background on Mary Baker Eddy. She was born in New Hampshire in 1821. Um, she married at a very young age um, to a man who died very young, um, and uh, she had a very difficult time recovering from that loss. The child that she had was actually taken away to be raised by relatives because Mary Baker Eddy, Mary Baker at the time could not um, uh, take care of her child herself. Um, she later married another man who was taken prisoner um, by the Confederates during the Civil War, and she didn't see him for a very long time. And she was also the type of person that because of all of this trauma in her life, you know, suffered from a variety of both psychological and physical complaints. And she, like lots of Americans at the time, was looking for help with them. And she stumbled upon Phineas Quimby um, while she was seeking help. Um, she began writing to him early on, and then she actually moved up to Massachusetts so that she could begin studying with him, because she believed that even um, their uh, exchange of letters had helped her so much that she wanted to learn his method directly from him. Um, like I said, in 1866, um, Quimby died, and this also was a major trauma for Mary Baker Eddy um, uh, because she had essentially lost her mentor at that point. Um, <clears throat> after he died, 
Um, she experienced um, a fall, basically. She was walking around in Lynn, Massachusetts, and she slipped on some ice and fell and hit her head really hard and um, had some kind of concussion. It's, it's not totally clear exactly what the diagnosis was, but she reports in her memoirs that the doctors thought she was going to die um, and uh, that she was in a great deal of pain and, and everybody was basically like had, had given her up for dead. And she claims that um, after the doctors had left, that she took her Bible and um, was reading it and praying and contemplating it, and that um, through that, she managed to heal herself. Um, through that period of time, she came to realize again that there was basically no reality in suffering or sickness or injury, and that through that realization, she had cured herself. Um, she later wound up writing a book about this called um, Science and Health with Key to Scriptures, um, and this was published for the first time in 1875, though she um, revised it many uh, different times over the course of her life. Um, <clears throat> so what's kind of interesting about this is that um, it combines like the stories of religious revelation, sort of like Joseph Smith. You know, she's reading her Bible, she's praying, and she kind of has this insider realization. But she also writes in such a way that she compares it also to like um, scientific discoveries. Um, so she often refers to this moment where she had this realization of how to be well as the falling apple movement. So like a falling apple, she realized, you know, the um, unreality of all physical suffering. And the falling apple is, of course, kind of a, um, a reference to how Isaac Newton supposedly um, discovered gravity or, you know, came up with his own theory of gravitation. Um, so, uh, you know, she's basically kind of joins kind of the rhetoric of religion and the rhetoric of scientific discovery in order to create a movement that is basically a hybrid of each. Okay. She would insist on continuing to call it a church, but like she published these journals that read a lot like medical journals in a way. Um, and eventually there was actually a church built and completed by 1888. So it's called the Mother Church in Boston. Um, Christian science is also obviously pretty unique because it's a religious movement that is founded by a woman. And in the late 19th, early 20th centuries, Mary Baker Eddy became one of the most famous and wealthiest woman, women in uh, the United States. So here's what Christian scientists believe. I did this for the Mormons, and I'll do this for the Christian scientists too. Christian scientists believe that God exists and is omnipotent, meaning he is all-powerful. And they also believe that God is the only source of reality. So it is God who produces everything that is real. Um, they believe that all matter is fundamentally unreal, and that our belief in the reality of matter is a result of flawed human perception. Um, they also believe that the Bible is a true but not a literal account, um, that Jesus's miracles were not extraordinary interventions into the natural order, but a demonstration of the unreality of matter. Okay, <clears throat> let's spend just a couple of minutes talking about this, okay? So what she kind of keeps from conservative Christianity is this idea of a single God who is the source of everything, who is the creator of everything. But she has also gotten a lot from her teachings, the teachings of Quimby, and also from the ideas of the transcendentalists like Emerson, of this idea that our sense experience, so what we perceive through our senses, senses is unreliable, okay? And that all we really know is what is inside of us. And she kind of takes this in a much more radical direction. You know, Emerson, like I said, is still appealing to these indisputable foundations. And um, Mary Baker Eddy basically comes up with this idea that basically the mind is all there is. Our mental experience is all there is. That our bodies are not real. Our mind is. And that our minds essentially create our physical experience. That there is absolutely no fundamental reality to your bones, to your skin, to even your brain. That what is really real is your mind, is your thoughts, is your spirit, etc. Um, what she also then kind of, where she differs from a lot of conservative um, Christians at this time, is in believing that the Bible is true but not literal. Again, so she's, she's not claiming, like, again, that the Bible is completely inerrant or... Um, uh, <clears throat> or that it has no lies in it, no, no untruths in it. She believes that it's true, but like Emerson, she intends to interpret things in a much more metaphorical way. So, you know, when Jesus performs miracles in the Bible, 
um, her interpretation of, of that is that basically Jesus just knows what Mary Baker Eddy knows, which is that there's no reality to the, bi to the body, and therefore there's no reality to sickness. Um, and that therefore, when Jesus healed people in the Bible, or when prophets healed people in the Bible, those were not miracles. So they were not some extraordinary disruption of the natural order. Rather, they were demonstrations of the fact that the suffering was not real. When Jesus heals the leper, what he is doing is he is helping the leper realize that his leprosy is not real, that he's not actually sick. And so that's how the leper gets better. And so if this is just a demonstration of some truth about the universe, then um, everybody ought to be able to do it. Okay, so just by realizing that your disease isn't real, that your suffering isn't real, um, you, can, you can be cured of whatever, of cancer, if you, if you try hard enough. So <clears throat> they also believe, um, again, that sickness and suffering are the products of a false belief. Okay, so when you feel sick, or when you have pain, or when you have some kind of problem, it's uh, the problem is that you have a false belief in the reality of matter. So again, the problem with the leper is not that he has leprosy, it is that he thinks he has leprosy. Um, therefore, healing can be achieved through the realization of matter's unreality. So the leper gets better when he realizes he doesn't have leprosy. Um, and they also believed, though, that this is a really difficult process, so that it required a lot of study um, a lot of prayer, a lot of contemplation, and a lot of humility and effort. So they didn't think that this like happened instantly, that you just thought about the fact, oh yeah, matter's not real, and all of a sudden you were better. They believed that it took a lot of time. And so like Christian science healers would just spend a lot of time by people's bedsides talking them through this and, um, you know, and, and, and reading the Bible with them and praying with them and discussing this. And so you can probably see how, again, given the fact that 19th century medicine was so very unpleasant. And given the fact that, again, um, we all have plenty of physical complaints that we can say so ha um, have some kind of psychogenic um, origin, um, that having somebody just sit with you and talk with you about things um, probably does help quite a bit. Okay, so um, this, this for many people worked and it got really, really popular. Um, <clears throat> it is different from some related healing movements. So like I said, when I talked about Pentecostalism, um, the holiness movement that emerged ar around a similar period of time, so in the early 20th century, um, you had these guys um, who claimed that they could perform healings, like the healings that Jesus performed in the Bible. But this, this, which is called, this practice, which is called faith healing, is very different from Christian science. Because the faith healer believes that he is performing a miracle. Okay, so That God is coming into him and allowing him to disrupt the natural order. Um, by healing a person. Christian science do not, scientists do not believe that. They don't believe they're performing miracles. They just believe that they are helping you get better by um, helping you realize that matter is not real. Um, this, like I said, became really, really popular. It was accepted in a variety of different intellectual circles um, and some very famous people who you might know um, got interested in it. So um, this, by the way, I don't know that Tchaikovsky ever studied Christian science or was particularly interested in the teachings of Mary Baker Eddy, though I have found um, some uh, records uh, that there was some uh, kind of cross-pollination between uh, North American Christian scientists and um, some kind of Rust Russian mystical traditions. But there is an opera called Iolanta by Tchaikovsky in which um, a princess who was born blind um, is kept um, in kind of this secluded um, uh, place in which she is never allowed to know that she is blind. So she is basically told that basically there is no such thing as light, that her experience of the world is completely normal um, and is the experience that everybody else has. Um, and meanwhile, the king, her father, is going around looking for people to cure her blindness. And so this, this doctor who comes from the Middle East um, he comes and examines Iolanta, the princess, and he basically says that she can never be cured unless she understands that she is blind. Okay, so unless uh, she understands that there is such a thing as light, which she has never experienced before. And so, um, obviously, this is a little bit of the reverse of Christian science. The Christian scientists would say that um, the key is to realize that you are not blind, um, but nevertheless reflects the fact that in a lot of European intellectual culture, there was um, a lot of interest in this idea of the power of the mind over the body um, and the ability of the mind to play some role in healing physical complaints. 
Um, <clears throat> so therefore, Christian science, um, the thing is, is that Christian science was also um, pretty controversial at the time, because uh, even though, like I said, there was some um, kind of elite interest in these concepts, um, you know, they were nevertheless going around claiming to be able to heal cure people of cancer, to like deliver, you know, participate in difficult um, childbirth, um, to like be able to set bones and that kind of thing, like which it seems like it would be very difficult to apply this kind of theory to that sort of thing. And in fact, there were plenty of cases of people dying because um, they had, uh, instead of pursuing some kind of traditional medical treatment, they had called upon a Christian scientist. Um, this also happened to be the time when medicine was in the process of reforming itself and so becoming more like the modern profession that we understand today. Um, so, and Christian science helped kind of, was kind of one of the drivers behind the, um, the rush to um, create laws that mandated basically who could claim to be a medical practitioner and who could not. Um, so um, Christian science practitioners became the targets of doctors who were seeking these kind of legal restrictions. So the cases of deaths of people who were under the care of Christian scientists um, were kind of held up as the justifications for why these laws were needed. And then you actually had some very high profile deaths that actually led to the trials of Christian science, science practitioners for manslaughter. So for example, there was this famous um, writer named Harold Frederick. We, you don't hear that much about him anymore, but he was very well known um, in his time. Um, he was a writer for the New York Times and he also wrote several novels. Um, so he died in 1898 and um, what happened was he had a stroke. And um, at the time, he was living with a woman who was not his actual wife. This was his mistress. He was married to somebody else at the time. And um, his mistress was a Christian scientist. So Harold Frederick had a stroke. And um, some doctors came and attended him. And he did not like the doctors. He was kind of a cantankerous man. And his mistress convinced him to, instead of doctors, to receive treatment from her friend who was a Christian science practitioner. And so he said, yeah, okay, I'll do that. Because he did not like his doctors very much at all. And um, he wound up dying about eight months later. Um, and uh, the doctors who had been treating him before were basically horrified by this, horrified that they had been dismissed in favor of this Christian science practitioner. The fact that he, she was a woman almost definitely had something to do with that too. And so um, this happened in England and there was a coroner's inquest in which um, the Christian science practitioner was basically um, accused of manslaughter. Um, then this was actually like tried in court um, and uh, basically they couldn't really prove that the doctors could have done anything for Harold Frederick um, if they had if um, he had been allowed to treat him and also like Harold Frederick was doing this based on his own will like he he himself was the one who said I prefer the treatment of a Christian scientist rather than the treatment of a medical doctor and you know there was kind of this idea that well if we start um, like accusing people of manslaughter uh, simply because like somebody asked them to treat their disease and basically every family member who ever recommended like a folk remedy or something like that would suddenly become murderers like it just opened up kind of a whole legal um, can of worms and would create all kinds of problems and um, there was a belief in the time kind of a fundamental belief in therapeutic freedom and the idea that people ought to have a right to a say in their own medical treatment of course this is still a value that we have today um, and so these women were basically um, let free and this outraged a lot of people by the way but um, was nonetheless the result um, so some other famous people who were into Christian science Mark Twain um, his wife and a couple of his daughters were very interested in Christian science Mark Twain also did not think very much of um, modern medicine and he and his family tried lots of different medical sectarian cures um, mind cure or Christian science um, mind cure is kind of the secular term for what Christian science was doing um, I, I, they, they tried this quite a bit, um, Mark Twain himself, too. The thing is, is that Mark Twain actually did not like Mary Baker Eddy very much. Um, he thought that she was kind of trying to take control of a set of ideas that um, were already kind of well known at the time, that she hadn't really invented anything herself, that she had basically stolen all of her ideas from other people. Um, and he wrote this book called Christian Science with notes containing corrections to date. Um, I, first as a series of articles and then as a book, you know, with all of these corrections in it. Um, I, in order to basically talk about how he doesn't like Mary Baker Eddy. And what's interesting about the book is at no point does he say, 
like Christian science isn't true or that there's nothing to what she says. And in fact, he kind of says the opposite. It's basically, yeah, of course, a lot of this stuff works, you know, but um, she's a bad person and I don't like her. Um, and I don't like her business practices and I don't like how rich she is. So because she did get very quite rich by selling her book, by um, selling lessons to Christian science practitioners, etc. So she um, he did not like that at all. And um, so he wrote about this. He also had like this weird science fiction story he wrote um, about like a dystopian future in which um, the entire world is run by Christian science. Um, it's, it's not published, but you can find it. It wasn't published alone. It was never finished, but you can find it in some collections of his work. It's a very, very odd thing. Theodore Dreiser, who you have probably, um, heard of or read before, um, he also was very interested in Christian science. And in fact, he and his wife sought the help of a Christian scientist when they were, um, in the middle of kind of a, a rancorous period in, in their marriage that wound up ending in divorce. Um, and he himself suffered a lot from depression and from kind of the, uh, uh kind of the physical effects of the depression. Um, uh, what was diagnosed at the time as something called neurasthenia. And so he and his wife consulted with a Christian science practitioner and he felt it helped him uh, quite a bit. Um, he actually wrote about this experience in his um, semi-autobiographical novel, The Genius, uh, which I believe you can definitely get in Russia. It's basically out of print in um, the United States. Uh, but he, there's like a whole 80 page section in which he talks about Christian science. Um, Christian scientists also founded a newspaper, which is still printed today and is still actually very well respected. Um, most people who have read it do not realize that it is published by a religious group. Um, it's won several Pulitzer Prizes, especially for its foreign reporting. Um, and it's also kind of an interesting artifact and kind of an indication of how this is a religious group that is kind of bridged um, various different communities. Like it, um, it, it is fundamentally a religion, but it's a lot of other things too. Okay, <clears throat> so um, Christian Science, like I said, also had lots of spin-off movements. Um, like um, Mark Twain suggests, um, Mary Baker Eddy didn't invent the idea that the mind has a lot of power over um, your body, um, or the idea that um, you know you can uh, basically heal certain kinds of complaints by um, kind of dealing with the mental problems and not just the physical problems, um, that some of our physical problems actually do have a mental root. She didn't invent this idea and she didn't really own this idea. And actually, like, um, she um, kind of made a mistake that I think a lot of religious leaders make sometimes, which is that she tried to, like, gain really fierce control over the ideas that she was teaching. And she basically rejected or cast out anybody who had a slightly different interpretation of what it was that Christian scientists were doing. So what wound up happening is that you had the official Christian science church that, like I said, is today very, very small and pretty idiosyncratic. Like you still have Christian scientists who reject all medical treatment and you still have cases of people who die because they were only allowing the treatment of a Christian scientist rather than a medical doctor. Um, but many of her students went on to kind of found their own movements. And in fact, some of the, the other students of Phineas Quimby went on to establish their own movements. And many of these people kind of didn't really like Mary Baker Eddy's like kind of stern Christian um, ethos. You know, they didn't like, they thought she was too much of a prude, like um, it was uh, a little bit too tight morally. Um, a lot of reliance on the biblical scriptures. And, you know, these were sophisticated, educated, cosmopolitan people. And they may have been also been interested in things like Buddhism um, or Hinduism or other, you know, sort of Eastern religions. And they kind of wanted to blend their interest in mental healing in this healing method with kind of their other intellectual and um, religious interests. And so you get the development of this movement called New Thought, um, and a um, new thought becomes kind of not only a healing movement, but a kind of total way of seeing the world. You know, this idea that basically we can overcome any problem just by thinking the right thoughts, you know, by focusing on the right things, particularly on like positive things like love, like joy, 
you know, like compassion, etc., that by contemplating the right ideas, we can make a better world. So this is a quote from Ernest Holmes, who is one leader of the New Thought Movement. He says, love is within us. Um, it cannot be destroyed. It can be ignored. To the extent that we abandon love, we will feel it has abandoned us. Denying love is our only problem, and embracing it is the only answer. Through the power of love, we can let go of past history and begin again. Love heals, forgives, and makes whole. So again, it's kind of this totalizing philosophy of everything that like love is at the core of everything and if we only love enough we can fix the entire world you know and this of course this is basically a an image I pulled off of a quote website because it of course looks like a thousand things that you've probably seen on Instagram um, so and uh, the reason you've seen it is because it's all kind of trickled up like it's become a major part of um, Western culture a major part of American culture a major part of popular culture just more generally so, like, it takes on new forms later in the 20th century. Um, in the 1930s, 40s, 50s, you get this idea of the power of positive thinking, which was um, this book published by a minister whose name was Norman Vincent Peale, which is just the idea that, again, that if you just think positive thoughts, you can not only have a better life, but you can make a whole better world. And then, like, in the 2000s, um, you got this woman named Rhonda Byrne who wrote a book called The Secret, and the secret is where you get the idea that um, that basically um, you manifest things in the world just by thinking about them. So if you think really hard about how you want to take a vacation in Thailand, and if you just concentrate all of your energy on that, then you will eventually get that vacation in Thailand. Or if you really want a particular job, that you just need to concentrate all your energy into imagining what it will be like to have that job, into thinking of yourself as doing the responsibilities in that job, um, and you will eventually get the job. So this is where you get, like again, that idea of manifesting things in your life and people creating vision boards like these posters that had images of all the things that you want to get in your life. Um, and that's supposedly by, um, by doing this practice, you will um, be able to make all of these things um, come true for you. Okay. So um, like, again, you can kind of see this everywhere. Like people, people talk about this in yoga circles. Um, there's lots of social media influencers who talk about this stuff. Um, you know, and, and it, it kind of permeates both the right and the left, like it doesn't have a particular political leaning necessarily. Um, but this is actually what I would like us to do in our online discussion this week, is I'd be interested in where you have maybe seen these ideas pop up. And the ideas I'm talking about are this idea of mind over body, this idea that your thoughts have a significant impact on your physical experience, whether that's like how you feel physically or even just like what's happening in your life. Okay, that that in order to get what you want out of life, you need to just simply think the right thoughts. Um, because you, you, you know, most people don't really know this, but many of these ideas like have their origins in the things that Mary Baker Eddy and the Christian scientists were talk talking about. So like I said, this is a very different story from the Mormons. You know, this is a case in which basically the ideas have like just filtered out absolutely everywhere, even though the church itself remains really, really tiny and fairly marginal. Um, so uh, I look forward to seeing what kind of things you guys bring to the discussion um, this week. Um, I actually think this is not a bad time, maybe, <laughs> to be dwelling on positive thoughts, um, although at times it may seem a little bit ridiculous to be doing so. Um, uh, but again, I, I, I think this will be a really interesting exercise, and I look forward to seeing what you guys contribute. Thank you very much.